Welcome back to Raised by Giants, where we talk all things spirituality. I'm Ryder Lee. Tonight, we have former U.S. Army Intelligence, Security Command, and the Defense Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Science and Technology, Dr. David Morehouse, speaking about being a psychic warrior, human possibility, and extrasensory perception. But before I introduce him, check out Raised by Giants on Rockfin. It is a completely uncensored platform. Go over there, set up a free account, get all of my regular content I post here on YouTube, and sign up for Rockfin's premium content, which is far less than a YouTube premium account at only $10 a month. And you'll get all of my premium uncensored content when it gets released and all of the other creators premium content as well, like Beyond Classified, Charlie Robinson, Jay Dyer, Zero with Sam Tripoli, Tinfoil Hat, Eddie Bravo, and Rex Bear Leak Project, and much more. Check the link in the description to sign up for the video streaming platform. Rock fan. Also, check out C60 Purple Power. It is the most powerful antioxidant on the planet. Helps with energy levels, skin problems, infections, eyesight, brain cognition, EMF radiation, and a lot more. It's a free radical sponge that gives your body the ability to heal itself. And if you use promo code GIANTS10 from the link in the description, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. I highly recommend it. I've been using it for over a year with my own money, and I wouldn't recommend something that doesn't work. Introducing tonight's guest, Dr. David Morehouse. From 1987 to 1991, David Morehouse was assigned to several highly classified special access programs in the United States Army's Intelligence Security Command and the Defense Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Science and Technology as a top secret psychic spy, a remote viewer, an Army Ranger, Master Parachutist, pathfinder, scuba diver, and special operations soldier. His distinctive military skills place him in a select group of army officials. He holds a master of military art and science degree, a master's degree in administration, and a doctorate in education, and the recipient of numerous military awards and decorations. He is the author of many books, including the bestseller Psychic Warrior, written in 14 languages. Hello and welcome to the show, Dave. I appreciate you coming on. I'm very excited to speak with you. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been doing a, uh, a deep dive on all of the government re- remote viewing projects and a lot of the MK Ultra programs because I believe that they're connected and like we were just talking about before we started the show and hopefully you can help me uh, connect some dots on that later on. But I thought first where we would start off tonight is kind of like a, a history of remote viewing and how this started for you and how you first got into the Stargate project. Uh in terms of just the overall history of, you know, remote viewing, my, I am probably <clears throat> the least capable of, you know, telling that story accurately in terms of the dates and fund, funding and those kinds of things. I know the highlights of, of it, uh, but I was not in the program uh, for an extended period of time. I was there for three years uh, because because I was the first and actually only combat arms officer that was ever recruited into the into the organization. And I, of course, had no intention of dropping anchor and staying there for 10 years or 15 years, as many of them did. I mean, some of them spent three over three quarters of a year of their of, of their entire military career in that unit, which to me was just preposterous. Uh, I I think they started to lose effectiveness because they got there's a after a certain amount of time there, you kind of start to lose interest in it. Uh, at least I did. And I think from what I could see and hear from people that were there, 
the same kind of happened. I think they should have not allowed that to occur, and they should have put those people back into their regular MOS positions and asked them to, to serve in that capacity, and then uh, bring in fresh trainees and train them effectively and let them do their work. Uh, but uh, when I got there, one of the things that I discovered is that a lot of the people just got there and became very, very lazy and complacent in what they were doing. They never wrote a manual, ever. There was no manual. And uh, one of the things you you do as you come out of the Ranger Regiment is, <clears throat> you know, everything is performance-oriented training, and you have very high expectations of anything, any unit you're going to go to, that if you're going to learn something very specific, that there is going to be at least a training outline or a program of instruction uh, or a manual to follow uh, so that you know that there's a standardized delivery of training and that you're going to be given you know, all six stages of the, you know, the entry program, which is coordinated remote viewing, and not that you were just going to set up and kind of be at the whim of whatever trainer happened to stand up in front of you that day. To me, that was pretty maddening and, and to a certain degree uh, disappointing. And I couldn't understand how the unit could have existed as long as it had at that point. And nobody ever forced the issue of writing a manual. <clears throat> so uh, I ended up doing he, that. At the Ego Swan, Ego Swan wrote something, didn't he? <clears throat> didn't he write? Uh, he no. didn't write anything. No, he he wrote many books, and he probably wrote something. But whatever it is that he wrote, that was not passed on to the unit. And if it was passed on to the unit, it was long forgotten and lost from the time that he did the training in 1978 for them to stand up an operational military unit uh, as part of INSCOM <clears throat> before it ever got to DIA. And it was not, it was non-existent. And I know that there are some, there's at least one of my former colleagues who claims that he wrote a manual that is out there now? Well, what if and if he did, and when whenever he did, uh, that manual was non-existent in the unit when I entered it, and it was non-existent in the unit when I left it. So if it was ever in, you know indeed created, it was done after the fact and put in there. Now I'll tell you why, in my opinion. Uh, just in the last three months, because I was getting ready to go to Command and General Staff College. And I knew that that's what I was going to do. I was not going to stay in the unit. Uh, I had to go, I had to get out of it. I had to rot in, rotate into one last special access program, then roll out of that when I completed that mission and go to Command and General Staff College. <clears throat> so Dr. Jack Verona, the chief scientist of DIA, and Fern Galvin uh, approached me in my last three months and ask if I would write a manual because they knew that training in the Ranger Regiment was kind of my forte and as it was as a, my first company command because I was taught to be a military trainer by the finest military trainer that you know ever, ever laced up a pair of boots with which was Kenneth C. Lure, uh, Major General Commandant of the Infantry School and also the man that Creighton Abrams gave the charter to uh, reform 1st Ranger Battalion in 1974 to stand up the Rangers within six months. So I did. I wrote that, and it was some 258 to 268 pages long, as I recall. And I turned that in, and it had a sample session that accompanied it through all six stages. And, you know, it's only been in recent years that I actually found out that People like Paul Smith and even Ed Dames uh, were only ever trained by Ingo Swan through stages one, two, and three. He didn't train them in four, five, and six, which I didn't know that. I mean, I, I saw their sessions, but I did not know that they had no idea about four, five, and six. And there, it's a six-stage protocol, so it's really weird that, you know, they he only trained them in three stages and not the other three to, to make it a complete package. But and Ego Swan was already out of the unit by the time you got in, correct? Ego Swan was never in the unit. He was never Ego in the Swan unit? Was a, he was never in the unit. And Ego Swan was one of the test subjects at Stanford Research Institute International in Palo Alto, not part of Stanford. It is an independent research laboratory, and it was contracted 
by Robert Gottlieb uh, at the at the direction of the uh, of the uh, director of the Central Intelligence Agency when there became uh, a Cold War fears about the fact that the Chinese and the Soviets were heavily involved, it appeared, in the, you know, in psychical research. They were looking for natural clairvoyance, particularly children, and they were pulling them in and they were isolating them and forming teams and, you know, allegedly turning them into or trying to find out if they could harvest from them some sort of Cold War value, intelligence or otherwise. And so there, I know there are, are skeptics that will then turn around and say, well, that's just, no, there's no proof of that. Well, how would there not be? I mean, it, you know, of course, there may not be proof of it, but are you, are you seriously doubting that that was what was told to, you know, that that's what came up through the intel community that you think that the CIA really wanted to find some reason, some excuse, some lie to go, you know, to start researching, uh, you know, psychical uh, human ability. They certainly didn't need that. They could have just done that as a internal special access program. They didn't need, you know, to try to come up with an excuse for why that was, that's just ridiculous. So that concern <clears throat> cited, just paralleled with everything that Gottlieb and Dulles and everybody else, Helms and all those in between around that area were concerned about, which was there was tremendous concern that the Soviets and the Chinese uh, as communist entities were looking for ways to control human thought and therefore then be dominant world powers by being able or developing a way to, you know, to control humanity on, on a large scale. Uh, in fact, rightly or wrongly, there was a level of fear in the analysis of what communism was, where people were looking at it and, and not understanding how someone like a Stalin, for example, or even a Mao, for example, could get away with murdering millions of their own people, and yet the people stood for it and didn't rise up and rebel against them uh, and crush them and try to go back to a new reformed way of government. It was just the way it was during the Cold War. Quite frankly, we couldn't understand how that kind of ideology could flourish. And, you know, that kind of ology, ideology there looked at us and couldn't understand how ours could flourish. But all of that, the, the rights or wrongs or the merits of it are just the, the positions of history. But you have to understand and embrace the notion of that is what was going on at that time. And we've, we're looking at this now right as a point when you know, the, the Vietnam War is ending. You've got, I think it was what, 72 was Kent State. Then after that, you've got, you know, 73, the Paris Peace Talks happen. When Kent State happens, that just catalyzes the American, uh, the national perspective of anti-war fervor. And rightly so. I mean, it's unfortunate that that had to be the final catalyst that got our government to understand that it, the war was wrong, despite whatever the the original merits or thoughts were in in you know putting us there. It was wrong to escalate it. So we were, you know, we're now a nation that is hardened against the war. Uh, we disbelieve our government. We are now in '73. Paris peace talks happen. It's ordered that within the next 90 days, uh, all of the American troops will be gone. Uh, then it's uh, at some time, some point in 74, the last troops are gone. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a, an alert that goes out that says operation, operation <clears throat> something wind. So I think silent wind, operation silent wind. Don't quote me on that. But that goes out, which notifies the emergency evacuation of Saigon. So within 24 hours, 7,000 Americans and every uh, you know Vietnam Vietnamese supporter of us, political, military, or otherwise that we can fit on transport, gets pulled out of Saigon. And within 12 hours after the last helicopter lifts off, uh, communist uh, the North Korean communist uh, entities begin rolling in to occupy Saigon and take it over completely. We're now in a position where 
I think it was in 73 where the selective service draft system is cut off. It's no longer in existence. Now the entire military structure of America goes into a volunteer footing. You have this whole place. Uh, everything is changing. The military has no idea how they're going to be able to man uh, a force, what, whether it is Navy, Marine Corps, Army, or Air Force. How are we going to man a force? We don't have the ability to make a selective service and draft people. You know, what are we going to do? That's when Task Force Delta concept uh, is pulled together. And Task Force Delta is a think tank of high, high paid, you know, ranking generals and colonels and high paid uh, ranking Department of Defense civilians and Department of the Army civilians who all come together to try to come up with what are we going to do? <clears throat> how are we going to reshape the military as a volunteer force? And how are we going to make that? you know, happen in very quick order before we lose everything and everybody and Congress cuts the budgets and we now no longer have any way to stand up against the Russian bear, you know, and China. How do we do that? <clears throat> That's also when uh, Lieutenant Colonel Channon comes in with, uh, he comes in with the 1st Earth Battalion, which gets made a mockery of this jackass that wrote the book, you know, uh, The Men Who Stare at Goats. Uh, and just makes a mockery of him and his work. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I'm really offended by that that guy uh, who didn't even write the book, but then put his name on the front of the book and uh, then, you know, lines himself with George Clooney to make this movie, which furthers the insult to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Channon at the time. And then I was really happy to hear that finally the truth came out because the jackass who put his name on the book, his actual researcher and writer who wrote the book that was cut out of the movie deal. And so that guy gets all pissed off and he sues George Clooney in the production company because he said the whole thing falls apart and all these buffoons that are involved in this thing, right, are now like, holy shit, now we got to tell a real story about what happened here. Right, yeah, okay, I didn't write the book. I'm sorry, you know, I misrepresented it all. And anyway, it, that's happening. Uh, Channon comes on board you know, with First Earth Battalion, which they're briefing. He's briefing it. His slide deck was like 268 slides. And he is briefing these slides throughout the Pentagon. And people are listening. There are four-star, three-star, two-star, one-star generals sitting in these briefings listening to this. Why? Because they didn't know what they were going to do. And the idea that, okay, maybe, you know, maybe this will be something we will stand up. And they had a plan. To, pro to do this thing, to fund it, to stand it up in 81 and for it to be fully operational at the brigade level or regimental level uh, by 1991. <clears throat> that was there. You had neuro-linguistic programming comes out in the 70s. Mm. You had, uh, God, you know, ever, there's tr performance-oriented training emerges in the 70s, the product of Robert Mager, Dr. Robert Mager. Uh, you have all these different concepts that are coming into existence in the 70s, many of which are being embraced by the government, funded by the government, many of which are being used to try to renovate the U.S. military on all levels and the U renovate the government, renovate the direction of the, the, national, uh, the national people, I mean, of the national interests. <clears throat> so much is taking place now. And the idea that something like uh, the golden sphere concept, which was kind of taking enhanced human performance potentials and focusing them towards special operations forces, which didn't really exist up until, or start until about 78 or 79, but that concept was put into place where they were going to explore things that could enhance human performance potentials. This is the time frame when you've actually got the publications now coming out talking about John Boyd, a U.S. Air Force pilot, fighter pilot, who never lost an air-to-air -air engagement. Why? Because according to him, he had developed a, system, a, systemic, a systematic process uh, of fighting, which was the Boyd cycle, it was originally called, and later called the Oda Loop, Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. It's all over the internet if you mm. Google it now. There'll probably be 20, 230 million uh, sites that carry it, but it was the invention of a warrior to observe, to orient, decide, and act. 
observe, observe, orient, decide, and act. And boy, for the first time, was talking about the fact that he had a capability developed where he didn't see where his enemy was. He was an air fighter ever, pilot, right? Air Force fighter pilot in mm-hmm. Viet in 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 Korea and Vietnam, and he did not fight by chasing his enemy, you know, until he got a lock uh, or got them in the gun sights and pulled the trigger. Uh, He maneuvered his aircraft where he knew the enemy was going to be, kind of like Wayne Gretzky playing golf, right? I mean, golf, hockey. Wayne Gretzky said, I was never the fastest skater. I didn't, I couldn't outskate people to get to the puck. I just went to the place where I knew the puck was going to be through study and analysis. And sure enough, that's why he normally picked up the puck and went with it because he knew where it was going to be, where other people were reacting to it and chasing it. Well, Boyd does the same thing. So all these new languages and all of these new, you know, outcome-based training and evaluation and performance-oriented training was changing the landscape of everything on the national level and the military on how we educate, train, evaluate education and train, blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, you know, here comes this idea that we should find a research organization like SRI International, and we should give them a sole source contract, which the CIA did. And they should then be involved in the evaluation of, uh, you know, essentially three to four deliverables. The third, the first deliverable is you have to be able to substantiate scientifically that there is a human psychical ability, that there is a human <clears throat> ESP, that there is a there is an ability by however you define it for an individual under certain circumstances and conditions to see t- to see something distant in space time and to be able to report accurately on what that is. You have to prove to us that that's an ability. <clears throat> well, the proof of that came rather quickly, like in within probably 18 months to 24 months. That was the first deliverable met. And that was SRI, uh, TARG put off at all, going back to the CIA and saying, we have proven that beyond a doubt, you know, empirically, that this is, an, uh, this is a human ability. And the CIA, not you know, not being stupid, didn't take SRI's word for it. What they did was they hired auditors, you know, Pair Labs and uh, SAIC uh, and others. Uh, there might have been one other auditing agency, and you know those agencies were involved in parapsychological research and probably would have liked to have had that sole source contract, but didn't. But they went in and evaluated SRI's scientific methodology and 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 their conclusions, their data and their conclusions. <clears throat> there were some minor, you know, corrections in some of the things that, in the way that they were doing it, but nothing to jeopardize or to call into question uh, the results or their analysis of the results. So the the deliverable stood, and the second deliverable was, can you tell us who will be good at this? <clears throat> Because if you're going to tell us what the personality type is, the IQ or whatever it is, background, whatever it's going to be, that'll allow us then to do like the Soviets and the Chinese have done, which is to move through the population, identify people that may have a propensity for this kind of thing, and pull them in, isolate them, utilize them in whatever capacity we can. And this is probably one of the more profound things that came out of uh, what SRI said. And I believe that the individual who was the purveyor of the final analysis on that was Russell Targ, who came forward and said that this is not an ability unique to any single person or group of persons. This is an ability that we have found through our testing of a wide variety of subjects is, is inherent in every human being. In other words, you're born with it. You're born with the ability. You can, through the you know the legions of the status quo of our societies, uh, either have that completely dumbed out of you, because if you don't have parents that recognize it, believe it, and nurture it, then 
you're you're going to have parental you know uh, crushing down on that ability and your recognition of it. You're going to have peer uh, you know pressure uh, that it is it's ridiculous and and fake. Uh, you're going to have religious pressure uh, that it is of the devil or something else. Uh, you're going to have uh, societal pressures of it. You're going to have every kind of imaginable pressure that tries to remove your ability or your awareness to appreciate the fact that we are born with an ability to be hyperintuitive, hypersensitive, hyperaware, hyperknowing, that in fact, we are all omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and eternal. And the knowledge of that is ours from the day we take our first breath. There are ample researches that were done, most of them pioneered in Scandinavia by, uh, by pediatric psychologists and psychiatrists who have published extensively on this subject. And you know, can it, North America, Canadians and uh, Americans have also studied extensively and published on this fact that children are born into this life with, an, with abilities that we just fail to recognize and harness, but yet the children are born in this life, know that it's there. They articulate clearly that they know where they came from and they know why they're here and they know what they're supposed to be doing when they're here. And they have, they're, they're too young to have implanted, right, memories. These are memories that truly they brought from whatever existence we were in before we came here. Uh, I think that's a big role. Of, that that, but. I think that's a big role of religion is uh, dumb uh, mm. to kind of suppress these innate abilities that we all have. Because I agree with you, and I agree with Russell Tarr coming to the conclusion that we all have them. It's just that they're suppressed through uh, religion, suppressed through societal uh, indoctrination and uh, programming. Right? Yeah. Somebody just asked me this past week when I was talking. They came up to me and they said. You use this term omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal. So you use it really frequently and, and freely. He goes, are you saying that we're all gods? Is that what you're saying? And I said, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying to you is that we were born with these abilities, which means that they were gifted to us, which means that there must have been a reason why they were gifted to us. And that those titles, the words describing what we were born with, are part of our language, and those titles were taken from common humanity, and they were stolen from us as descriptors of, of our abilities. And they were, as you said, taken by religion, and they were ascribed to invisible beings that we are supposed to accept exist on a basis of faith, and those titles were given to those beings and ripped from humanity. But they were our titles to begin with. Those were those that language to describe those things was not intended necessarily for the use of describing uh, something that we don't see or exist with physically. We only exist with it here or here should we choose to. But I'm much more comfortable saying that you or everyone listening or watching that all of them are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent and eternal. Now, there's a scientific understanding that couples all of that together, which we won't get into here, but there are ample lectures out there where I do talk about that, and it has everything to do with quantum mechanical interpretations, you know, you being used to explain quantum mind and quantum function in that respect. And it makes, it makes perfect sense, and it pulls it all together for me. So that was my point to this guy is, no, we had those words for us first, and they were taken from us without even asking, <laughs> right? Uh, so I'm not saying we're gods. I'm saying that we have, we have those qualities describe what we are capable of. Now, you asked me the question, and i sorry, it took me a while to get back here, but you asked me how I got into the unit. <clears throat> I was uh, a ranger company commander, and I commanded for a good while in, in the Ranger Regiment. And I loved my company and I loved my men. And I was uh, a notorious trainer. And so my men uh, were extraordinarily good at being Rangers and what Rangers were asked to do. 
and I was very proud of them. And they were, they were far smarter than me, I swear. And it was just a humbling experience to be with that kind of quality uh, for so many years. But uh, there came a time where I was nearing the end of my command time and I was going to have to leave the Rangers. And I was, my company was selected by uh, the Ranger Regimental Commander, who then briefed the Chief of Staff of the Army, that we're going to send this company commanded by this guy, and we're going to send them to Jordan to train Jordanian Rangers. And so that is where we went. We deployed to the Kingdom of Jordan. It was a training exercise. I'm sorry, I got to turn this back on if it'll come back on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were sent there to train, and it was a really weird experience because, I mean, awesome, but strange because the only way, the only thing that the Jordanian Ranger, you know, battalion commander ever related to my soldiers, my Rangers, was to you know, brandish his weapon and, you know, point it at Israel. I mean, God, they really hated the Israelis. So I, I kind of felt like we were really there just teaching Jordanians how to kill Israelis. If that was ever <laughs> going to have to happen, you know, uh, there wasn't any way around it. I mean, what else were we were training them, you know, to fight? I mean, I know that they didn't like the Syrians and the Syrians didn't like them, but I don't think the Syrians were going to invade Jordan or, and they certainly weren't. Uh, you know, pure arch enemies. So it was an awkward situation. But in one of the training exercises there, uh, long story short, I was hit in the head by a Jordanian fired machine gun, uh, not in the head, in my helmet. And it split the Kevlar and got caught between the, you know, the Kevlar layers. So it was a direct hit. It wasn't a ricochet. And it's, that's 2,800 feet per second per second. And I think it's, let's just round up. It's like 25 grams. So you do the math on that. That's almost uh, four foot pounds of pressure hitting you in the head at 2,800 feet per second. So it's mm. kind of akin to being slapped in the helmet by a really heavy duty swinging aluminum bat. And it took me off my feet and knocked me out. And when I was knocked out, I had... <clears throat> what I could only have described as like some vision or uh, maybe an out-of-body experience. And after that was all over, still shortening that story, I kept having these episodes of things I didn't know what they were. And I didn't really, I mean, who do you go to <laughs> in the Ranger Regiment, right? Who do you go? Do you go, do you go to the Ranger Battalion or to the surgeon and sit down and go, hey, you know, uh, just want to let you know what's been happening. Or do you say, you know, to uh, the range battalion chaplain, hey, I need some help with this. No, you don't do any of those kinds of things because if you do, you will be, you know, you'll be looked at like you're crazy. Walked, you'll frog walk to the nearest vehicle and take them <laughs> off the installation, and then we'll give your company to somebody else. So, long story short, it comes time for me to rotate out. Rotate out. I rotate out, and uh, I am uh, recruited into a special access program. My first. You know, I, I call it sometimes my first, my, the first circle of hell for me. Uh, and the first circle of hell became the Department of the Army Special Access roster. So now you no longer an infantry officer. Now your file has been sent to the DASER, you know, floor where uh, these people come up, sign you out of empty branch, put you in the Department of the Army Special Access roster. Now, so maybe are you... Are you able to disclose what the name of that special access sure as hell hasn't fooled me? I mean, I, yeah, it's never. Uh, if you want to read what that was, uh, there's a book that was published uh, by an author last name Smith, and it is called Killer Elite. Killer Elite. And there are two versions of that now one that covers uh, Royal Cape, the activity, uh, ISA the intelligence support activity. It covers uh, the activities work just up through kind of the time before me and the time while I was there. And then the more recent version of it covers the Afghan Iraq wars and the deployment of ISA there. Uh, but it's called Killer Elite. I'm surprised that the guy got away. I don't know how he gained access to all the information he did, but it is accurate. Trust me. 
It's accurate. It's accurate stuff. And uh, it, they're also called the Secret Army of Northern Virginia. And so I came there as the deputy executive officer. And the exact number of people there is classified. But suffice it to say, they have enough to do the job that they have to do. And I briefed John O'Marsh Jr., Secretary of the Army at the time, multiple times a week on what the activities of the activity were and what they were doing, where they were doing it. And because I had to get signed permission slips for him to authorize them to go anywhere because they had got caught lying to John O'Marsh Jr. before about what they were doing and where they were doing it. And he wasn't having any more of that. So I was in the activity and in the activity, you also go through a quarterly, as I recall, uh, <clears throat> counterintelligence polygraph and a sit down session with the psychologist, a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, PhD psychologist. He is there to keep his finger on the psychiatric pulse of everyone within that organization. Why? Because people fall apart when they live a lie. You know, they, when they live in this world of secrets, they freaking fall apart. You know, they become alcoholics. They get divorced. They get remarried. They get, you know, they get divorced again. Uh, they're just, it's not conducive to normal expecting human, you know, life. Uh, you are lying to your spouse. You're lying to your family. You're, you're lying to yourself ultimately. And soon what happens in those, in that, world of special access programs like that is particularly if you're not an intel person that's accustomed or expecting that that level of deception in your life is you begin to lose track of where the line separating the normalcy that we all seek in life and the lies that we are living in life that line begins to blur and so you lose track you are lost now you just navigate day to day through the soup of this. And, and some make it out alive, uh, some don't. Some make it out unscathed and undamaged, and many, many others do not. So it's, that's why he's there. And you, the first time, I know you take your polygraph, and then if you don't have deception indicated or it's not inconclusive, uh, then you get passed and he, you go sit down with him. And in retrospect, think about what it was. It was probably not unlike having a therapy session. You know, you're sitting down and he's asking you his standard checklist of questions. And then his final question is, is there anything else you would like to share with me? Which I always thought was pretty creepy because I thought, you know, what, do you know something I you think I should be talking to you about or what? And, and That's so a trick second, question. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a leading question. <laughs> especially when you're not used to sitting down with a psychologist because you're thinking like, he has my entire file and he has on my file and he's seen how I answered all of these questions in the interview process and you know all this crap I had to do in order to actually get hired, which you wonder if they're looking for the strengths or if they're looking for the weaknesses that they can eventually leverage in you. All these things run through a normal human mind, I think, when you come out of a normal, you know, combat arms world and step into that world. But it was a, it was an interesting journey, uh, I'll say the least. So, so the, how did you get out? I don't mean to be jumping around or anything, but how did you get out of that special access program? And your, what was your next one? Was your next one the remote viewing? Well, uh, let special me just access? say how I got out of that program. Okay. In my next, uh, in my next CI Poly, I had been struggling with you know what was happening continuing to have like these out-of-body experiences again that i don't know if that's what they were they're just the best thing that i can use to describe them and i had been you know dabbling and i went to uh i took some hypnosis classes i was doing extensive reading on things and so i get into my next counterintelligence polygraph and I then am just seeing if I can relax through the polygraph and that kind of stuff. And it, it pops up as inconclusive. Well, in other words, they're going, you know, you're, you're, you're screwing with us here. You know, you're playing some kind of game here. Mm. I go, actually, no, I'm not. I mean, I'm just meditating and relaxing 
you know, through this. I, I know you want a baseline here and then you want to see variations in the baseline go, but I'm just trying to be relaxed and focused here. So we go through it again and it comes out inconclusive. Well, that pissed the, the polygraph guys off. So they take me to the commander and pass that result off. It's inconclusive, perhaps deception indicated. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute, don't, don't, I didn't do that. I, that's not what happened. I was yeah. just meditating through this thing. So that then gets me into the, my next thing is off to the psychologist. And as I'm sitting down with it, the line of questioning now becomes significantly different than the first time the line of questioning, because now what he's looking at is, is there anything I can pull out of this guy's brain that kind of parallels the uh, inconclusive uh, CI poly rating and the possible deception indicated. So I go through this thing. And again, this time when it gets to the last question, are you, you should, sure there's nothing you want to share with me? And I just like, oh, well, fuck it. So I tell him the story. <laughs> I tell him the story about getting zinged in the helmet, you know, and about the thing that happened after that and about these out-of-body experiences that I'm having. And uh, I actually don't have any idea in retrospect why I actually said that. I, I just thought like, okay, maybe he knows something I don't know. And maybe there's something he can tell me that I should be doing, you know, to try to get this stuff in check. And also there was a little piece in my brain that was going like, holy crap, man, I hope he doesn't like pick up the phone and call Walter Reed and <laughs> send me off to Walter Reed where I'm now going to be issued this, uh, you know, a pill pack of psychotropic medications. I'm mm. going to be, you know, chemically neutered in the head for the rest of the time. Mm. It was really all those things kind of went through my head. And uh, when I had shared that with him, he didn't do any of that. He turns around and he opens up this file safe and he pulls out two blue folder stamps, secret, secret grill plan. And <clears throat> these are, these are remote viewing sessions, although it didn't say that, but they are, in retrospect, just to shorten the story for you, there are remote viewing sessions that were done in support of the failed Iranian hostage rescue attempt. Remote viewers were used to try to determine you know, the outlay, you know, the geospatial orientation of the land and where things were and where hostages were, where guard towers were, all this other stuff, because we didn't have that intel. Uh, we also didn't have an ability to determine where or what was inside the embassy and what the floor plan looked like inside the embassy. Can you imagine that? We did not have the floor plan for the U.S. embassy in Tehran in the U.S. State Department. We had the floor plan and the copies of the floor plans in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. So nobody planning a rescue mission had hard intel on where stairways were, which windows were bulletproof, which ones weren't, which, how, which way doors opened or anything else. Of course, they had people trying to reconstruct it from memory, but that presents tremendous problems for uh, Charlie Beckwith and, uh, you know, as the ground component commander in this hostage rescue attempt, trying to figure out how the Delta operators are going to get in there and what they're going to do and how they're going to get access. And also where might the hostages be located? So I'm looking at these sessions. And as I'm looking at these sessions, there are just verbiage on them that kind of stood hair up on the back of my neck, like, you know, pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room and things like that. I mean, if I had seen that written in a science fiction book, I, I novel, I would have thought, oh, well, okay, you know, somebody's imagining this. But when you're looking at it in a classified document sitting inside a secret compartment at information facility, and you're reading this on an official document that is, it was poignant. I mean, it, moved me. It piqued my curiosity. And so the next morning I went to the psychologist and I said, I, I'm fascinated by this and I want to know more. That began basically a six month limited read on of having me see various sessions after sessions and read certain articles and read Intel reports and do other kinds of things. And unbeknownst to anyone at uh, ISA at the activity, this particular lieutenant colonel was one of the scout recruiters 
<clears throat> or INSCOM, uh, and the DIA Directorate of uh, Technology and Science, and may maybe even the CIA, but was a recruiter looking for pot potential candidates to go be trained. Colonel Stubblebine? <clears throat> Who? Colonel Stubblebine? No. No, a different guy? The Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Cole, K O W A L. Hmm. But Stubblebine so, was also responsible for recru recruiting people. Stubblebine was a major general. He was in command of INSCOM proper. Uh, he was not responsible for recruiting people to go into that program. Uh, he had deputies that were responsible for that. I have no doubt that he was probably briefed on who they were going to move over to the program as the program was there, but Stubblebine himself didn't recruit people. Uh, he was a major general in command of the entire INSCOM, you know, and that's a big command. So he, uh, but, it was, was, but it's said that he's, he was very interested in the ESP and absolutely. Uh, remote viewing yeah. and uh, a psychic phenomenon though. Right. Uh, he was probably more interested in it, in it from a perspective of, enhanced human performance potentials. He was looking for ways to get more higher levels of performance and focus out of his soldiers. Uh, and he was also supportive of this concept of remote viewing. He was, he was supportive of it because the initial testing that came out uh, was showing really promising results. And he was happy to be the guy that housed it, uh, funded, you know, funded it through his budget and, you know, put it in as yet one more piece of the intelligence collection puzzle. I mean, he was happy to, to do that. Uh, he was also uh, intrigued by phenomenon such as spoon bending. Uh, he was probably curious as a two-star general to a fault. And Ed Thompson, who was kind of his running partner in all of this, was the deputy chief of staff of intelligence for the army, another major general. <clears throat> and the two of them, uh, worked in, you know, together uh, for a big part of time to, you know, keep this program viable and funded and, you know, being utilized and trained people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a miss, you know, misstatement that goes out around a lot, which says that Stubblebine uh, wanted to use uh, the Monroe Institute gateway program uh, to train remote viewers. That is not correct. It's not true. Uh, uh, Gate Gateway program was the Hemisync program, right? It had right. nothing to do with remote viewing or the Stargate. Nothing. Yeah. Get, you know, that was Robert Monroe, who was a, uh, you know, a guy that worked in the radio industry, uh, who thought that utilizing hemispherical synchronization, binaural beats at different hertz rates played left and right, and the ear could induce an artificial theta wave state, which theoretically is accurate, but he didn't come up with that. That was actually first invented somewhere in, I think, 17, I think like 1740s or 1750s. I might be off by 100 years, but uh, I'm recalling here on the fly, but uh, a guy actually, uh, an Eastern European, who was an audiologist who used two wax cylinders that they stood on pedestals and then he had two assistants strike two different vibrations uh, yeah. at two different vibrations and tuning forks and hold them in those cones and then he interviewed the individual where the cones came in and interviewed them and asked them to describe the sensations that we were feeling that was the first hemisphere hemispherical synchronization uh, experiments and so invented them, but then picked up by the Monroe Institute, and then the term hemisync, you know, you know kind of became the operative word to describe them. But that was the CIA looked at them and came back and said, "Nah, you know, interesting, but not what we're looking for. Uh, we're not trying to, you know, teach people to have out of body experiences here. We're trying to teach people to be intel collectors. We want intelligence collected that's usable." And viable, and we also want it to come in a consistent delivery mechanism. So we don't want people, you know, coming up with whatever they come up with, and then throwing us a pile of stuff and saying, "Yeah, there it is. That's what I got." They wanted a protocol, a dogma. 
They wanted something that allowed them to have consistent delivery of the information, albeit cycling as all things do in terms of a human performance. In other words, the people producing it would be good one day, maybe not so good the next day, maybe horrible the next day, but then would cycle back up. Good, better, best, awesome, you know, back down again. They wanted to track it from that perspective. They wanted to have that kind of clarity and, and granularity and the metrics of remote viewers. So all of this, at this point, once it becomes a military program, it's all being heavily tested again by SRI, who have delivered that sex, second deliverable. And the third deliverable was, can you build a training program? Can you replicate this? Meaning, can you take people and train them to all perform exactly as I just pointed out? Can you come up with a, with a regimen, a protocol, a dogma, a discipline, you know, a step-by-step -step process where you can take these people who have these natural gifts and can you pull that out of them? Can you evoke Intel data out of them in a consistent way? Well, well, that's their mission, right? Uh, don't mean to interrupt you there, but this, this is an important part of it. Um, so we know that the Stargate project has been declassified, right? But I don't think that the exact mission of what the Stargate program intention their their intentions to do was actually declassified now you were right into the program you just said that you were read right in briefly over six months so what what did that read what was the actual statement or mission operation statement well, that, of the program what was the official thing that they were telling you that the program they was don't tell you that that's that's what a limited read on is limited read ons are where you're feeling somebody out to determine whether they are receptive to what they're seeing does it mean that if they're receptive to it doesn't mean that then when you give them the final read on the pitch uh you're pretty well certain that they're not going to turn around and look at you and go oh hell no i don't want to do that right. because that now becomes a loose cannon who you've told everything to and now you you know pitch it to them and we want you to be here. And, and people would turn around and go, no, absolutely not. I don't want any part of that. And they walk away. Then you have to threaten them with a debriefing that says, you know, you can't ever talk about this, which of course most did on some level, right? Mm -hmm. And especially if they were completely offended by it. Anyway, but when you were first was limited read on. Oh, yeah. And then I was brought to the unit and given a final meet a, a meeting with Fern Gavin, and I met the cast of characters that were there, Dames, Mel Riley, Angela Della Fura, Robin Dahlgren, Paul Smith, Gabriel Pettengale, Lynn Buchanan. And that, those, that was it at that time. Uh, two more came while I was there, but that was it at that time. And <clears throat> I uh, was brought back in to sit down with Fern Gavin and uh, the doctor left went out and met with the other people. And Fern Gavin said to me, I'm always impressed that there are young officers willing to give everything up to come and be a part of this organization, to which I thought, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, like give everything up. Uh, I don't even know really what it is you do here. I've just read some documents and I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by that, but I don't know what you're doing here or what you really do here. And he said, well, what we do here is young man is, we train individuals to trans transcend space and time to view persons, places, or things remote in space and time and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. Verbatim, that's what he said. And then he said, and we would like you to be one of us. But if you do, do this, your life will never be the same again. You are have, going to have awarenesses that you have never known before. Uh, that are going to change your perspective on more things than I can identify for you. In fact, if you agree to do this, I'm going to need to speak to your wife, which she did. And that was a conversation that I wish I could have been in the office as a fly on the wall for, because he brought my wife at the time, Debbie, in, and said to her the exact same things I just said with you. And he said, and how he got permission to do this he didn't get permission to do this. He just took it upon himself to 
to say that I'm going to do the best I can for these people. So I'm going to bring their spouses in and I'm going to tell them what's up and say that we really need to know you're willing to support this because if you don't support it, uh, yeah, bad things typically happen and did. So. But they didn't give her, they didn't give her any other information about what you were actually doing in the program, right? They were just like, yeah, hey, he's going to be different. Uh, Expect a huge change. They weren't like, yeah, he's collecting intelligence uh, uh, (laughs) data for military and uh, three-letter agency operations. Yeah, which, you know, but it was, he's not going to be the same man you married. He's going to change significantly. And we need to know you're going to support that and be there to support him because he's going to need your support. Because his life is never going to be the same again. And it's going to, because his won't be, yours won't be. So you need to understand that, be prepared for that. It's nothing bad. It's just that, you know, he's going to change in the way he perceives things and processes things and sees himself, his role in the world, and on and on and on. And he didn't do it well, but he did it nonetheless. And, you know, Debbie, uh, when I went out and got in the car and drove back with her all the way to Fort Belvoir, she was really troubled by that. It was a long car ride back. And uh, anyway. so you would probably you would almost develop <laughs> some sort of maybe the ego complex isn't the right word for it, but something like that, you know, you were almost better than other people in a way because you had access to more information. You can see things that were happening uh, no matter where you were in the world. Is that sort of the change that they're referring to in that? Yeah, it's it was sometimes referred to in a unit as a messiah complex. Mm, that's a really uh, good word for it. And it, it, you be you reach a point where your belief in something beyond the physical, uh, which is so common, you know, the belief in something beyond the physical. Even those who believe that there's nothing beyond the physical is still just a belief. You know, you believe there is, or you believe there isn't. And then if you believe there is, you believe that you may interact with it or you believe you'll never interact with it, but, but there's still belief structures. So is there something beyond the physical? Oh, I believe it. But when you're in the unit and you're doing the work that you're being trained to do, you can be like me from, from a scientific perspective and a, from a trainer's perspective. Uh, and to, you know, you can find yourself talking your way out of, of your performance in the early stages. You can say, oh, you know, I could have guessed that, or yeah, that really wasn't a lot of data and I'm really sure, not really clear how I got it. Uh, but as the days and the weeks and the months begin to ebb along, the volume of data and the clarity with which it is derived and the manifestation of your mode modalities of perception. Like I became a visual, I found I was visual and auditory. So I could hear things and see things and sketch things uh, and probe and label with a decent command of language. So I could pull verbal sensory data out in all the categories of data and and remote viewing, coordinate remote viewing. (laughs) And um, it gets to the point where this idea that you can talk yourself out out of it or, or explain it away it, it it just slows to the point where you now look at the volumes of data that you're producing when you get your feedback and you just now know that that only came from one thing. My ability to access my unconscious mind connected into the holographic matrix field to detect, decode, and objectify data. I did not create that out of some fantasy. It's too much data. It's too accurate. And it's too consistent for somebody to just make it up. And every day, two targets a day in training, same thing, same thing, same thing. By around about the three, three and a half month mark, you now understand that you know that there is something beyond the physical and that you know you are connected to it. So going from believing to knowing is the most powerful transition that any human being can make. And once that occurs, that's the part where your life will never be the same again. Now, you now know that you are connected into the holographic matrix field, into hyper, you know, eight dimensional hyperspace. And you know you have access to the waveform expressions 
of all things everywhere at one time because from the quantum mechanical perspective, waveform travels by every possible path, meaning it is omnipresent. If it is omnipresent, then you have access to, access to it anywhere. You're not projecting outside the room of Fort Meade, Maryland to you know, someplace in the Soviet Union. You are standing in a holographic matrix field, filled with the waveform expression of all things. That is why you are omnipresent. That is why you are omnipotent and omniscient. And that is why you are as eternal as the waveform which you are detecting, decoding, and objectifying. That is why. That's why. And when that happens, when that reality hits you, it never weakens and it only intensifies as you go deeper in the training and deeper in the training and deeper in the training. That's what builds the Messiah complex, because now you see the rest of the world uninitiated, unawakened, uh, not understanding what that is or how it is or why it is or how you get there. You start to see through the veneers of other beings. I mean, you just are. Unfortunately, you become kind of hypercritical of things. That's not a good way to be. Uh, it's not, especially not a good way to be in the military as a serving officer in the military, mm. but it create is a lot of problems for yourself, basically. Yeah. yeah I, I, they I like to teach you how to deal with that. They don't, they don't have a protocol that said, Oh, you may start feeling this way. And if you recognize that here's what, what, you know, here you can talk to some, some colleagues about how to deal with it. First of all, my colleagues, every one of them, but me came into that unit because they professed a capability and an understanding. So if they recognized that early on in life and had a, danced with that, then they weren't one, they weren't people who went from being a disbeliever to suddenly being someone who was awakened and aware as someone knowledgeable of their now new, newfound superpower. Uh, that didn't exist for them, but it certainly did for me. And anybody else who walked into that and was trained, uh, who had no preconceived notion of an ability like that within themselves. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how you had this out of body experience that, from the way that you're explaining it, almost kind of unlocked your abilities. Right? And I think that that's how it was the gunshot to the helmet that right, unlocked yeah, right. the awareness of it anyway. Exactly. So through that, you were able to have access to these abilities. And that's a common theme that I hear about a lot of psychics or remote viewers or, or people that have these kinds of abilities. It's, it's unlocked through some sort of trauma or some kind of out-of-body experience or near-death experience. And that seems to be very common uh, through a lot of remote viewers and psychics. I mean, Ego swan, it can be physical trauma, emotional trauma, spiritual trauma, it, trauma, because why you're born with the ability, but then the world tells you how to define your reality. And so society, the world at large, tells you what you are not, much more often than it tells you what you are. And so you go through life unrecognized, unrealized, non-validated. And then suddenly a trauma, spiritual, emotional, physical, you know, knocks open a conduit into the unconscious. And now instead of minor occasional perturbations, you know, up into the unconscious where you become aware of something without knowing, you know, intuitive, uh, intuitively speaking, you know, something without knowing how you know it. But now after this trauma, uh, that conduit is open more frequently or maybe it stays open. But yes, you are correct. Uh, that is one pathway uh, to get to that. And it's one of those pathways, which is just, it's really just an accident, right? A fluke of, uh, of a person's trajectory that causes that to happen. Another path now, hearing me tell you that this is an inherent ability in every human being is simply to ask, ask, for, ask to be trained, you know, ask to be trained and be trained and have your own awakening, your own transformation, and then choose to go with it where you will go with it from there. 
Now, let's say, uh, Dave, that you wanted to create a psychic or create a remote viewer. Now, what programs do we know of that had trauma induced into the program, right? What None you, that I know of. MK I'm, Ultra. MK Ultra was a yeah, trauma that based wasn't program. Building psychics. Uh, MK Ultra was about mind control. It was about perfecting the ability to dis disassemble a human being's natural defenses, psychological defenses, and to reconstruct them in a manner that made them malleable to the purposes of the CIA. Remember, the CIA, under the fear umbrella of dealing with communist China and the Soviet Union, where they firmly believed, rightly, wrongly, with evidence or not with evidence, that the objectives of the Soviet Union and Communist China were world domination and world domination through mind manipulation and control. That was what they were trying to prevent or trying to, or maybe even trying to build that capacity themselves and make sure that they had it as yet another Cold War tool, another Cold War weapon, if you will. But they were not trying to build psychics. They were trying to build, they were trying to build and show that they could control the thoughts and the emotions, the physiology, uh, the intellect, uh, the defenses of another human being for whatever reason. Well, I'm not That's saying that that would be the only goal that they would be doing. I think the MK Ultra programs were a myriad of things. There's a lot of sub projects that Sidney Gottlieb was working on that did deal with psychics and ESP involvement and remote viewing. There's over five of the declassified documents that was specifically designed to study ESP and uh, psychic phenomena. I, I, but I don't know that what you're talking about was pure MK ultra program or was it stuff coming back from, cause I've read them as well. And I I'm just saying there's some, when there's some crossover in some of the stuff that was being done and I'm not disputing what you're saying. I'm just saying I, what would his job was, is not to determine whether or not psychics, whether a psychic ability actually existed. That was well outside his uh, his brief. Uh, his his job may have been to explore whether or not uh, chemical or botanical enhancements could be used to improve psychic ability. He may have looked at something like that and taking it outside of SRI International. Now I would absolutely. Absolutely uh, agree with that as a pro as a possibility, but <clears throat> he did not have a mission to find psychics. I mean, right, I don't think that that was the mission. I don't think that that was the intention of it, but it could have been a result of it because yeah. trauma is very, uh, you know, like you like we've been talking mm -hmm. about. It's something that someone has to go through to kind of unlock their abilities when they've been suppressed on a on a regular degree, and that's what a lot of the MK Ultra programs were about was traumatizing people to break their to separate their consciousness to create a uh, an altar that can kind of be controlled. That's the whole purpose of yeah. you know mind controlling people. So I think that maybe that it was kind of something that was discovered within the traumatization of the people that's been through any of the MK ultra programs. I'm not, I'm not saying that yeah. that was their sole intention. That wasn't what they were setting out to do, but I think that it could have been a, uh, something that developed after they had started the programs. I don't know. It's kind of just, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that assessment at all. No, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> so he was a freaky dude, you yeah. know, you have to suspect that you have to be highly suspect of a guy who loves the polka dance. Okay. When that's, <laughs> when that's your hobby, polka dancing. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know, all the polka dancers and listen. But <laughs> to, to his dying day, he was enamored with polka dancing and folk dancing of all sorts. <clears throat> that's yes. interesting. Yeah, really interesting. So let's uh get back to a little bit of the uh we kind of got off a, a little bit on there. Let's get back to the actual Stargate program. Can you describe or talk about any of the targets that uh, uh, that you were 
to remote view for the intelligence uh, community to collect intelligence data? Yeah, uh, it, it ran, look, <clears throat> there are all of these different intelligence collection methodologies that are out there. It used to be called the five disciplines back in the early days. Now there are far more because now you have uh, you have science uh, and uh, you know I mean uh, uh, cyber was which is cyber intelligence and you have digital intelligence and you have all these others that are out there the newer ones uh, but you still have the old mass ants and you have imint uh, you know and you have uh, humint and you have uh, elint and and fodent and you know have all these different classic uh, collectors that are out there. And the truth of it is, and you must understand this, anybody listening, is that none of those intelligence collection methodologies are 100% accurate. And none of them are 100% accurate. Uh, human being one of the least accurate because, you know, you're harvesting one person's interpretations or opinions, and you don't even know if they're being truthful about it. You're just harvesting it and reporting it. So human, none of them are 100% accurate. If any one of them were, then that might be the one that they relied upon most heavily, but they aren't. They're all subject to interpretation, all of them, human interpretation. Even if it's satellite imagery, it's subject to human interpretation. Anything they suck off the wires or out of text or anything else, it's all subject to human analysis and interpretation. So none of it's 100% accurate, which is why all of those collection methodologies exist. And it's also why the, the most powerful method of collecting accurate intelligence pictures is to do what they call all source collection. And in all source collection, uh, the analysts or the taskers, the customers who come to the, you know, kind of the clearing houses like NSA, DIA, <coughs> whomever else, uh, come and ask for, we need intel on to fill this box. Well, the people that, do an extraordinarily good job. Don't just go to a few select uh, Intel collector sources. They go what's called all source. So they send it out to everybody and they say, "We it, give us everything you have that can help fill this box. And that box being an Intel puzzle. And what they're looking for is everybody, you know, to provide pieces of that puzzle. And they do. And Scient, or psychic intelligence, uh, that came from remote viewing, was as valuable and held its own right along with all of the other intelligence collection methodologies. And the only people who ever said that that was not true were people who were hired by the CIA after they were closing down the unit when Psychic Warrior was written, and in order to try to tell their version of the story first, and to try to get people to just think that the CIA was saying, oh, yeah, well, it was a mistake and you know, we're not going to do it anymore. And sorry, folks, but it's done. And we conclude that, that it wasn't accurate to begin with. Total bullshit, a total smokescreen done for one reason to try to get people to go, well, we were going to really hammer you. But then, yeah, you're you admitted that you did it. And so now you're not doing it anymore. And we believe you. So. Anytime you hear the CIA talking to you, it is not the central information agency. It's not what that stands for. It's an intelligence agency. And if they're talking to you, if their mouth is moving, then they're trying to get you to believe a version of the story that they are giving you. They are not there to inform you. And they don't care less whether you feel informed or not. They are giving you a version of the story that they want you to bite off on, chew and swallow, because then mission accomplished, we have put that to rest. They are masters at it. And yet people, you know, oh, the agency came forward and told us all this stuff. Oh, there's a FOIA document release. Their whole story of remote viewing is all in the FOIA documents. No way. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's 73,000 pages of shit from that over 30 years of remote viewing that they cherry picked what they wanted you to be able to see. They picked very carefully what they were willing to tell you about and allow you to read, you know, to try to make some people look good, some people look less good, you know, but no real missions, you know, exposed, et cetera. 
So yeah, missions that were done, you name it. Anything that was done in the intelligence collection world, again, for anything, you know, crashed planes, <laughs> meetings in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, uh, planned attacks, analysis of attacks that had already occurred, hostage locations, you know, live or well hostages. Are they alive? Are they well being interrogated? How much longer do they have? Where might they be? Uh, <clears throat> you know, how about uh, locations of uh, Soviet intercontinental ballistic warheads. You got a missile blossom that's got five or uh, rather 10, you know, silos. And in those 10 silos, there are four uh, ICBMs and they move them around. Where are they? Where are, which ones are they going to be on? Uh, are they in these or are they in those? And, you know, uh, how about, uh, you know, a double agent was killed. Okay. Did, how did that double agent get killed? Did the person that killed him know that it was a double agent? Uh, was it just a double agent? Was that double agent actually a triple agent? You know, things like that. You know, it, it was everything you could possibly imagine. It then migrated into things as the war on drugs started. Then it was using remote viewers like other things that were assets that collect intel on that. It was using remote viewers to, to determine, uh, you know, uh, three ships getting ready to go to sea. Are there illicit drugs on all three of them? or two of them, or only on one of them. And, and, and that was it. Okay, then it would be, okay, where are the illicit drugs located? I mean, okay, so now viewers are going back and looking, and this is all done blind, mind you. So the ability to task and keep it blind is, is masterful by Fern Gavin and others to make that happen. Because if you just said to them, hey, there, there's three ships leaving and we think there's drugs on them, it, what do you think? Which ones have the drugs? And where do you think the drugs are? Well, that would just be front-loaded, you know, analysis of people deciding where it is. No, it's got to be blind. And so then you do it. And, you know, and, and viewers through their broken approach to it are coming back and saying uh, it's on board all three. Uh, you know, it's sealed behind hatches and inside bulkheads and blah, blah. And, uh, and it, they're going to link up in the open ocean at some point, you know, northeast of Hawaii, and they're going to link up with another vessel, and they're going to transload their cargoes on the one vessel. So there are going to be four vessels link up ocean to open ocean, and all cargo is going to be taken off the other three and put on the one. And the uh, one is going to go wherever it was going to go. That ended up scoring a huge DEA bust of cocaine. That was actually the largest bust they ever had. So <clears throat> the DEA wanted to know who was helpful in, in doing that, projecting that. And it went back to DIA DT-S uh, to, to us, to the remote viewing unit. And so the DEA wrote a letter to the unit, you know, thanking them for their work. I don't think they had the slightest idea how that information was derived, um, but they gave uh, challenge coins. They sent a bunch of challenge coins, uh, DEA challenge coins to uh to the unit and everybody got them but it was it was funny to me because lynn buchanan thought they were metals i go lynn they're not metals oh no no they're to metals no they're not metals they're challenge coins yeah you know, if you anytime you're around dea guys you got to have that coin if you don't you have to buy the drinks you know trust me i know this i mean in the rangers we had them and i you know a guy came in the, into the locker room shower one time butt ass naked and we're all in there showering he came walking in and he squatted down. He, he had his Ranger challenge coin stuck between his butt cheeks. And his <laughs> coin drops out in the shower. Everybody else is going, fuck. Okay. All right. We're buying. All of us are buying drinks. So you know, he challenges all. There were five officers in there. He challenges all of us. And we're like, okay, we're all buying. Five rounds. Okay. You got it. That's you, hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So Lynn really thought they were medals. They were not medals. Lynn, they're challenge coins. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, well, I had a question and I just, uh, I just lost it right there. Oh, it was the butt ass naked part with the chair. It was the butt ass naked, threw me off, threw me <laughs> off, uh, there, Dave. Uh, thank you for that. But yeah, if the, if the program didn't, uh, produce any kind of substan substantial data for the military and, uh, these three letter organizations, then why did they keep it open for 30 years? Right. Precisely. It yeah. doesn't make any sense why they would do that now. Yeah. 
Were you ever tasked with a target inside of the United States? Were you ever tasked to spy on any politician inside of the United States and the other government agencies and the other three-letter organizations, the military within the United States? I, I will say this, and I'm not trying to be evasive in my answer, not to my knowledge. However, uh, I would not be surprised at all uh, if that were done and how, who the customer would have been and how that would have come through the targeting tasking process. Uh, remember that usually if the a tasking of that nature came to the program manager like Fern Gavin, he <clears throat> may or may not be aware of the tasking, uh, of the nature of the tasking. His job is to formulate a targeting package, assign coordinates based on the concept of that target, then task viewers, then to bring the data from those viewer sessions, summaries and sessions, and to correlate data that comes out of that that answers the targeting question or series of targeting questions. So <clears throat> if he was blind, which sometimes happened, frequently happened, he would not have known the nature of those kinds of targets. Uh, if he was witting, he would have known it and whether or not he would have tried to invoke a, you know, some sort of a, a legal precedent that said, no, we can't do that. It's not in our brief to do that. Uh, whether he would have done that or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he was, after all, a career, you know, GS-15 intel officer. So uh, whether he would have taken a stance on that, I'm not clear on it. What I will say is this. <clears throat> Almost every time a new commander took over the Defense Intelligence Agency and they were briefed on all of their units, uh, in the three, time, three years I was there, at least two commanders entered, but we did withstood at least four inspector general uh, inspections, visits and inspections. Now, anybody that's ever been in the military knows that those are supposed to be unannounced uh, visits to look for compliance, uh, but they dig into everything if they come. And they also, anybody that's been in the military knows that despite the fact they're supposed to be unannounced, somebody always calls somebody and says, you know, on, on Monday they call and say, hey, on Wednesday they're coming. So be ready. So whenever that happened, we would come back into work and we would find 10 burn bags. Now, for those that don't know, burn bags are when, when people go through and purge document files, they shred them. And then the shreddings are put into what are called burn bags. And those burn bags are picked up, they're stapled shut. They're picked up by a classified transport. They're taken to an incineration facility where they incinerate them. And after they incinerate them, the ashes are put into tumblers and mixed with water. That's how serious they are about destroying any evidence of what was on those documents. So there would be five, 10 burn bags, sometimes more, sometimes slightly less, stacked up in the waiting room, you know, waiting for somebody to come and pick them up the next day. This was the kind of thing that caused us to sit around as viewers and talk. Uh, some of us more aggressively than others. What are they destroying? What are they burning? And why are they ripping it out of the files and burning it? It means that we're being asked to do something that they do not want a general, a, you know, a, G, a general officer inspection uh, team uh, to see. Uh, they, the general inspector team is looking for things that are either the compliance or things that they think are inappropriate that could question our compliance within the laws of that organization. So could we have been tasked to look at things that we weren't supposed to be looking at from, you know, the legal standpoint, given the brief, the charter of the organization? Absolutely, we could have been. Uh, would anybody have come to us and said that we were doing that? No, they wouldn't have. But 
Could it have happened? Yeah, probably more. I'm probably more sure that it did happen than I would be questioning whether it didn't happen. I mean, I'm, why would we be burning stuff mm -hmm. like that? Why would we be purging files? Because what? There wasn't an expiration date on Intel data gathered through the process of remote viewing. So if it was in the files, then it stayed in the files. It was part of the historical record, the continuity of the organization. So you don't purge it for some stupid reason because somebody's you know coming to look at it. I mean, these were historical files related to the work of the unit. That's what they were. The taskers, you know, everything that was there, the work of all the viewers and what we were doing and other things. So I don't know why that would have happened, but it happened at least four times that I can recall during my three years of being there, at least four times, maybe one or two more times. And people began to question the merits of that. And that caused people to kind of secretly, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, or maybe two people started to started copying everything that they were doing. Any kind of tasking we were given, we copied it and we kept a copy. And we, we took them home and we kept them because we were concerned about, we were concerned about a number of things. We were concerned about the destruction of the hit, historical record of something that we were involved in that we felt was uh, controversial, but at the same time, cutting edge and trans transformative for human for humans, and and it was something that eventually needed to be told on some level, and that thought ran through everybody's mind. I assure you, on some on, the, on some level, it's why Joe McMonagle and Skip Atwer wrote their books, you know, about uh, trying to talk about remote viewing without calling it remote viewing. And certainly not connecting the dots between remote viewing, military intelligence, CIA, you know, DIA, and you know, SRI International, but still trying to talk it out, talk it, and say this is ability we recognize with and we play with. Uh, I know that Paul Smith, one of his great frustrations was the fact that when Psychic Warrior came out, God, I hate that title because I don't consider myself psychic. Mm -hmm. But when that book came out. He was really upset because I know Lynn Buchanan told me this, that the first words out of his mouth were, I wanted to write that book. So, like, so, so I shouldn't no. title this show Psychic Warrior? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to write that book. And so, no, he wanted to tell his version of that story, but uh, I don't think he had the right motivation to do it. And he certainly wasn't going to violate a secrecy oath. And he certainly wasn't going to, you know, I don't think had within him the idea that he was willing to withstand the consequences of that uh, had he made that choice. Uh, in, in many ways, I think if I had that choice to do over again, uh, I questioned myself on occasion, you know, would I, would I make that same choice? I mean, I probably would have retired as a general officer had I not made that choice. And I made that choice thinking that I probably have, I think, you know, I, I just thought that human transformation, human empowerment, uh, through this gift of what we had worked in was something that needed to be shared with humanity and should not be continue to be sequestered away as an intelligence collection methodology. Now, by the time that you wrote this book, the project was still classified, right? So you were kind of leaking uh, classified information. That was oh, absolutely. The yeah. It was dereliction of duty, wrongful disclosure of classified information. And uh, had they court-martialed me, that's what I would have been charged with. But uh, I really thought that I maybe had enough clout because of what I had done in the Army for as long as I had done it, not working in the intel community, but what I had done in the Army working, you know, as a, as a leader and a trainer and, you know, a commander and just the things that I had done and the level of excellence with which I had done them that I thought in those circles that there were people that would have stepped up and, you know, defended me. And in truth, I think that the only defense that could be mustered, because I think all of them were probably outgunned in this argument. I think that the CIA and the DIA were very, very upset that one of, one of their own, even though I'll be, I just, albeit that I was just a temporary one of them, uh, I didn't grow up in that world and I didn't finish my career in that world. 
And I can't say that being in that world for the nearly six years that I was in it, that it was enlightening uh, or, you know, inspirational or powerful. I, I just can't say that. I mean, the remote viewing unit was an adventure and an awakening. Uh, torn image as a strategic deceiver was a tremendous disappointment to me. Royal Cape was of interest to me, but I also found out things in there that I was just unhappy with that we were doing and, you know, manipulating and building and utilizing stuff that I didn't think was fair or uh, appropriate. But still that those things were there and they were, these were big awarenesses and awakenings for me to see that stuff. Cause I had never ever in my life thought that I would be uh, a guy serving in the special access program like, like that. <clears throat> I just never thought that. In fact, the day that I was finished with my junior year in at university, the <clears throat> professor of military science, a Colonel Bartley E. Day, sat my at then wife Debbie down uh, to a dinner because he was retiring the next day. And he went through this whole explanation of two and a half hours during this dinner of telling me the do's and the don'ts for when I became commissioned as a regular army of infantry. Uh, an officer of regular army of infantry next year uh, when I graduated, just giving me his, you know, his two cents worth on everything about what I shouldn't do. And then he also quite prophetically turned around. He said, one day you will probably be asked to join the intelligence community. And if you were asked to join the intelligence community, don't do that. And then, you know, he went through all the explanations, which I shared with you and your listeners, uh, early on, which was you will lose your way because the line between reality and fantasy or fabrication is blurred. And then you lose track of where you are and you will have lost track of your family and damage the relationship with your family. <clears throat> but his third and last warning in that stack was to say, and if you choose not to listen to what I'm telling you right now, and if you ever find yourself somehow as a special operations infantry officer saddled up and working for and being part of the central intelligence agency shoot your fucking self that's what he said he goes shoot your fucking self and i, and I to which i laughed you know and then he wasn't laughing and i was like uh, uh you know yes sir uh and then i you know what going home with my wife at that time i was like can you that was really strange that was a strange exchange don't you he goes, i'm an infantry officer I'm not going to be doing any of that kind of stuff. And then here I am, right? <laughs> the trajectory of my life takes me to this particular place. And I ignore him and go through all of the things that he told me not to do. And I didn't shoot my fucking self. So I'm, I'm all the way through all of these things. And I kept thinking, going, what would be different now had I listened to him? I mean, what? Well, the truth is, I wouldn't be talking to you now. Uh, and because... I wouldn't have been, you know, I wouldn't have been in that, in, in the activity. I wouldn't have gone from the activity to grill flame. I wouldn't have gone, you know, I wouldn't have done any of those things. I wouldn't have written the books that supported that. And I would not have been awakened and aware. I'd have been done. I would have done something else and finished a career doing that. Right. And probably migrated right back into it in some level. I, when the war started, I probably what would not have looked to serve in some other capacity wherein I wasn't involved in you know, the killing of other human beings or the supporting of that. Instead, I got into medical training and work, you know, formed a company and worked in that and pulled together tremendous medical providers that taught tactical combat casualty care and those kinds of things. <clears throat> it was, it, it ended up absolutely altering the trajectory of my life by ignoring what he said. And I have to ask sometimes, is that kind of a synchro destiny? You know, is that what was supposed to happen is, you know, is it my curiosity and my passion for doing the difficult jobs that maybe nobody else wanted to do? Is that what brought me on that trajectory? Because the easy path would have just been able to say no, no, and no. And after the Rangers go do something like ROTC component duty, which then I would have really shot myself or to go be in recruiting command or to reserve component command, something like that all of which to me would have been uh, 
far worse than the eventual, you know, negatives that came out of working in the Intel community. So what was the third special access program that you were involved in? Because from my understanding, you were involved in another special access program after you left the Stargate project. Was that another special access program that involved psychic and remote viewing, or was it something completely different? No, I was recruited to become a strategic deceiver and a, a project that was codenamed Torn Image. Uh, that was the third circle of hell for me. Uh, that was uh, becoming a great skiller. So from regular Army Dasser Department of the Army Special Access roster to go from Dasser, then you go become a great skiller. And becoming a great skiller, that's a place where most people never come back from. Uh, you drop into great skills program and you never, you're basically never seen or heard from again. I mean, you work, you retire as a colonel, uh, but you're in places where only select people ever know what you do or ever look at your file and your files and your promotions are all done based on a select group of people looking at you from the fact that you're a great skiller. And I was brought in there. Uh, I once again had to lie to my family, uh, but I had to lie to my father, a career army officer. And I had to say that I had, I resigned from the army and I'm now a department, uh, a DOD civilian, you know, working for allied communications. And what I was really doing was designing a counter narcotics deception program uh, that would be sustainable and effective for up to 10 years, if not more. <clears throat> And so I did. I developed uh, one. I worked with Los Alamos Labs and, you know, putting it very shortly and succinctly, my mission in that was to uh, to develop a, a counter narcotics deception program that would bring about uh, the collapse of the three major produ cocaine producing cartels in the tier one and tier two countries of South America, Central and South America and to do so by causing an inter-intra-cartel war. And so I came up with this idea about how to match that and make that happen, that mission uh, brief. And that was simply to <clears throat> find a way to find a specific pathogen that would, you know, that lived on the host plant of the coca plant, <clears throat> recognizing that that could be different, whether the plant was in Bolivia or uh, Colombia or Peru or Ecuador or any other place, but to work with people that knew how to do this, but to bioengineer a plant pathogen specific to any one plant and bioengineer it to attack the psychoactive ingredient in the molecular structure of the coca plant and thereby breaking that molecular chain and rendering that plant's product, its psychoactive ingredient, inert. And then to take that pathogen and to determine different ways in which that pathogen, pathogen could be introduced into the hectares of the various cartels so that it would be self-inoculating, live in the root ball. And every time the plant was harvested, uh, it, if you processed it, it would still test positive for cocaine or coca in it, <clears throat> but the psychoactive ingredient would not break of that would not be detectable. That's not what the test looks for. It's looking for the presence of the coca in, in the, all the precursor chemical processing and the, everything else that's added into there. That's what it's looking for. So the, the fact that it was now inert would not be detectable until it was actually you know, cut up and dispersed, distributed, if you will. And so there were also ways in which you could chemically wash uh, kilos of cocaine, chemically wash them to remove the psychoactive ingredient and then reassemble them and repackage them and put them back into the distribution network. <clears throat> and in so doing both of those things and then spraying them into uh, the various hectares, we micro encapsulated the pathogens and pat micro encapsulation can be set for various ways in which it breaks down and releases the pathogen. It can be timing, temperature, moisture, it can, you know, 
It can be any combination of things. <laughs> it's really pretty ingenious. And we were spraying hectares of uh, Kali cartel uh, coca plants using aircraft that were identical aircraft belonging to Medellin cartel, wherein we then matched paint schemes and tail numbers. And then those aircraft would be seen spraying the Kali cartels hectares. And then they chemically washed cocaine as the, that began this inter-cartel war running back, you know, coming back through the distribution chain, costing lives because they had distributed and sold cocaine. Because their product didn't work. Didn't work. And so it became horribly effective in a very real way coming back. And then, of course, as that chain began to whiplash back and uh, cartel leadership became aware of that, and then you had these reports of you know, different cartels, known and unknown, spraying that that you know, became what a realization done. that that was happening. Now you begin the, in, in, inter, the intra-cartel wars. So you had inter and intra. You had the cartels warring amongst themselves, and you had cartels inside themselves consuming themselves and destroying themselves. <laughs> nobody trusted, nobody believed. And that was truly the time when you began to see, um, a, you know, a foothold gained in, in you know, the, uh, the unraveling of what was going on there in, the, in that world. And that deception was effective. And then it was shut down very quickly. And if you ask me why, all I can do is speculate. I can tell you what everybody else will tell you. As many people have, you know, come to the realization of, is that when it comes to the war on drugs, the war drugs, drugs uh, keep far too many people employed in this country. And so the idea that you're now going to shut that down completely and cause the purveyors of that to kill themselves off, you know, that you're going to cut down that entire process in one fell swoop with something, not that it, you know, would have not, not that it ever would not have been discovered because part of that was a deception, remember? And part of it was true. Part of it was real, what was, what you could do. And the other part of it is a deception designed to cause the collapse of that system. And it, it worked <clears throat> and then it got shut down. So, uh, then I, then I think, down, I'm thinking, well, if you intentionally, well, not you, but the, the project intentionally sabotaged these cartels' uh, drugs, then where do they get their drugs from to sell? Because they have to keep up their supply chain, right? So then that makes me think, oh, well, if you're not getting it from one place and you can't do it on your own, then... I feel like it's a multi-layered thing because we know that the government has been had a huge hand in the drug running in the United States, right? And that they that the United States actually supplies a lot of the drugs from other countries to bring into the United States. I mean, that was done during Vietnam. They were hiding heroin in the caskets of uh, dead soldiers and bringing back uh, pounds and pounds of black tar heroin. And and so it makes me think, oh well, maybe they were doing that for. Uh, a multi-layered reason, right? Not only to yeah, I mean, disrupt, no not only to disrupt the cartels and make them war with each other, but also to bring uh, the government's product to sell to them, right? I don't know. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense or not. Sorry, I'm, I'm fiddling with lights here. <laughs> <laughs> Shine bright. <laughs> it's like everything is like, and now it's like everything's behind me and not in front of me, so... I'm gonna have to go back in the dark. I think so. Back into the dark. Okay. I have no light on, on here. Let me see if maybe I can just change the background here. It might make a difference for you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, it's crazy that all those kinds of things happen, and that I happen to be part of that and seeing that. And but yeah, I did, and I was part of that particular mission, and. It was, uh, I mean, it was again, an interesting thing. And I have to say <clears throat> that I 
I can't say I enjoyed it, but I was certainly intrigued by that lifestyle and, you know, being able to be creative and, you know, put something like that together. But the other things that I saw, I mean, the other kinds of deceptions that existed there, even though we weren't supposed to know what each other were doing. <clears throat> we're talking about an organization then that had 41 people in it. And of the 41, there were probably only 20 deceivers. There were other, so that's 20 long-term deception projects. And the rest, it was admin support, research, you know, things like that. Like you would turn around and say, hey, I need to do this. And you talk to one of the researchers and their job was to, you know, their job was to find out if it was known somewhere in the world or in the university or, you know, any military installations or research installations, anything could help pull that stuff together for you. And then it was then your job to arrange meetings and go capture what you could capture to, you know, complete your project. And I, I enjoyed it. But, I mean, that part of it. Um, it was a little bit scary to be frankly, uh, you know, to be frank, uh, to see what we were doing and, and understand the power of a deception, which I really had never looked at, studied, or didn't have a big awareness of. I mean, I knew there were deceptions that went on during World War II, but even at that time, most of those were still classified. Things you hear about now that they put into movies or documentaries that talk about things that were done uh, that to deceive Nazi Germany and Mussolini and uh, hide things from Stalin. <clears throat> that stuff was real and it was effective and saved a lot of lives. But the, some of the things that we have as deceptions, at least what I became aware of when I was in a unit, God, I have no idea, you know, what's out there being developed now, but it, it was, it was an eye opener <laughs> to say the least. It was so an eye how did you get out of this special access program? Because you mentioned earlier that it's a very difficult program to get out of and that, um, you know, most people, you know, either retire or they die serving out that program. So how, what was the process of getting you out of that? Uh, it's, it's a matter of just saying you don't want no longer see yourself as a useful entity there. I mean, I wasn't going to, do something else. I was, I was hired to do specifically that. And even then, uh, I didn't have any intention of staying there again. I was just, this was just a tour of duty in Washington, DC to do, you know, to do things that interested me or that I felt the government wanted me to do because I might've had some skill that they recognized with it. And I just tried to do the best job I could do in all of those things. But my intention was to always go back to command a battalion, to command a brigade, uh, to command and to command anywhere and however long they would ever allow me to command. Because as an infantry leader, special ops leader, ranger regimentally affiliated, um, the highlight of my life was being a commander, was being in charge in, of training and you know, being in command of soldiers. And that was all I really ever wanted to do. So staff jobs <laughs> were just a means to an end. Everybody had to do them. Um, mine, instead of going to be, you know, one of the three R's, as I shared with you earlier, ended up being in these places, doing these things. I have no regrets. I don't. Uh, they were they were transformational in as much as they exposed me to a side of, of the military that I never knew existed. I, would I do them again? <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. But I don't really have regrets about them. They were amazing experiences. And over the years, to be able to turn around and say, I was one of those and I was part of that. And, oh, by the way, yeah, I also did that. That was, that was profound for me. And, but my job next was to go to command and general staff college and, you know, to get a master in military art and operational science, you know, military operational art and science or master military art and science, and whichever one I chose to go after. And <clears throat> that was my job next. So 
get become a graduate of command and general staff college because to select be selected to go is an, a great honor and it's a year's academic assignment and uh that's what i wanted to do and i, I went off to go do that and you know pursued a couple of master's degrees and really got myself prepared to go back to be a trainer and a commander again and stepped in the 82nd to be you know, battalion executive officer of 2nd Battalion 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment and did that <clears throat> and was well rated for that and then uh, stepped out of that and actually became an interim battalion commander while waiting for the new battalion commander to come in for a while and then uh, that was like in 93, I started making the decision to write the book, which was originally called Comes the Watcher and was 740 pages long. And then that manuscript with, script was whittled down, you know, by my editor, Sean Coyne and his assistant over a period of like two weekends down to 235 or 238 pages. That's what happened to it. And I really was had... That would that be what you would rather it be called is come the watcher or because uh, you said you didn't like psychic uh, uh psychic warrior what would you call it if you uh could rename it i don't know i because you know it became an international bestseller it's published in god 16 languages maybe more now uh it was the first book to actually expose the program as it existed uh and it also gave every other person in that program an opportunity to write their own versions of that story, uh, which they never would have done on their own. So that book, I just didn't care for the title, but I don't know if I'd rename it now, uh, but because the name is so kind of synonymous with that work and that activity and, you know, what went on there, but it's just... You know, not what I would have picked, but you learned very clearly was the first time author. Well, it was actually my second book. My first book was called Non-Lethal Weapons War Without Death. <clears throat> but you learn that, you know, as a nonfiction author that you really, especially with a big publishing house like St. Martin's, you don't have any power over them and you have to be tread lightly because if you're one of these guys that thinks that you're important, uh, they will very carefully, you know, ask you to give them back the advance and they'll just they hand you back your manuscript and you're done you know but you don't really get choices on those things i guess maybe if you were ultimately tom clancy that process might change but it certainly didn't change for me that time around anyway so <clears throat> yeah i don't know this is a good question i don't think i would rename it now but uh, i wasn't happy with it when they showed me the galleys but in 93 that's when the agency because the agency knows everything they first of all you know print media is a big concern to them back in those days print media is considered durable media it still is to this day it's durable media and durable media means it doesn't go away and since it doesn't go away there's always the book you know it's always there uh television media radio perhaps even the internet Eventually, somewhere, somehow, it's going to go away. It's, it's going to, you know, flatten out. People will lose interest. But that is not the case when it comes to uh, print media. So in all the publishing houses, there was always somebody there, you know, representing, working, or had contacts to the agency. And anytime something that looked like it could be questionable or expose something that probably shouldn't be exposed, the agency was notified that by that person. And, you know, the book was just barely in the galley form in 94, late 94. And it was already being copied by at least one of my former colleagues in, in DIA, in the unit, and had been sub submitted around to various people and said, you know, here's Morehouse's book, read this, and then call the publisher, here's their name, and here's his editor's name and phone number, call them and tell them why this book should not be published and how he's misrepresenting and he's a liar and those kinds of things. <clears throat> and that happened. Uh, but St. Martin's Press was, they had fully vetted this, and they were not going to stop the publication of that book. So 93 the agency knew about it. 94, 
everybody was, you know, pulling the circling the wagons and deciding what are we going to say? Because this is going to come out. And when it comes out, how are we going to control the damage uh, of it? How will we control that? And what you saw is what how they decided to control the damage of that. Their original thought was, well, let's just discredit the whole program. Uh, mm. If we can't stop him, uh, we've tried to discredit him, and I guess to a degree we did, but we can't stop it, and the book's going to go out there. And, and he's going to mm. suffer the consequences for what he did. But they also, during that time frame, took <clears throat> the program out of the special access program category and, and put it into the LIMDIS program, which means limited dissemination. Mm. LIMDIS, as I understand the legal terms under the Uniform Code of Military Justice or Department of Justice uh, approach to it, carries much severe penalties, federal uh, felony penalties for the disclosure of information as I did. So had I <clears throat> still been in the program or come out of the program, still been in uniform and then said what I said, I probably would not have been able to get out simply by resigning. And uh, that was done, you know, going from SAP to LIMDIS as well was hammered out. And then you saw the systematic, you know, trying to discredit the unit and discredit the union, then that they just tried to weaken it and hope that, you know, Americans were just gonna, you know, walk away chuckling over their coffee and donut, you know, looking at the newspaper uh, as it was being written. And I don't do think that, you know, I don't do think th they were successful. Do you think that that's the reason why the CIA didn't take over the program in 95 and they just shut it down? Something Actually, they did. Uh, the program was taken back. It was actually it was actually handed back by uh, DIA to the CIA. Uh, and I the exact reason for that, I, I don't know, but certainly it was it was to give you know give it back to CIA because at that point I think they thought that if Inscom uh, I mean, DIA continues to hang on to this, that it's going to look really bad for DIA. And DIA doesn't need to, you know, carry the bucket on this. The CIA has for decades always kept somebody between itself and the problem. It does that with great aplomb and skill. And it's, it's part of its mantra is to, if something is potentially controversial, keep somebody else between you and the agent, you know, between that project and the agency. And they did that and they used DIA in that capacity. But I think DIA just turned around and went, you know what? We don't want this anymore. You guys take it back and decide what you're going to do with it. And the CIA did that. And then the CIA systematically decided the way we keep somebody between us and this story is to just simply discredit the whole thing. Everything. That's just this, you know, go forward with a story that says Mia Copa. Yeah, we did it. We were just experimenting and looking at stuff, but it was never any valuable. It was not valuable to us. Never got anything out of it. Never acted on anything. Uh, and so, you know, look away, look away. You know, there's nothing behind the curtain. We weren't doing it at all. And that was their intention. And so they did. Now, do I think that the unit was completely shut down? No, I don't. Do I think that there are that individuals that were trained and or individuals who continue to perform in that capacity, that they were taken into another special access program or another limb dis program somewhere? Yeah. Because as I said early on in this engagement, is that Scient was as much a part of the collecting process of intelligence that was usable as any other intelligence collection methodology. It was not a standalone endeavor. It never was intended to be a standalone endeavor. It worked hand in glove with everything else that was being you know, utilized out there. And it was not 100% accurate. It was never pitched as 100% accurate. Neither is any other intelligence collection methodology. 
And it was always done as a team effort, not individuals, you know, crawling off into a corner someplace and doing something. It was teams of viewers doing this stuff. And <laughs> those are rules that were hard and fast in the application of this technology. Controversial as it may have been, it was usable and it was worthy of, you know, it was worthy of the, uh, the support that it gave and the recognition that it received. And I never intended for it to be, you know, diminished as it stood in the telling of the story. I just thought that the, the story of transformation was important for people to hear and know uh, because I, and I still believe that to this day, I would do it again. <laughs> I would do it again for the same reasons. It wasn't done for any reason of trying to be a whistleblower or something. It was done because I wanted uh, other people to go through the transformation that I had gone. Why? Because there was nothing in my life up to that particular point in time, despite being, you know, anything that I had ever done in religion or anything else, I always felt like a hypocrite because I did not receive revelation from God. I did not any of those things. You know, I did not believe in the power of prayer. I did not, uh, you know, believe that I could, you know, heal somebody or lay hands on and give a blessing and heal. I didn't believe any of that, despite the fact that I did it. Uh, and I followed, you know, the, the pablum and the speech protocols that I was, you know, expected to follow. And that all changed for me in, you know, from the activity to through Royal, you know, of Royal Cape and then through Grill Flame, Sun Street, the Stargate program came, it was called Stargate after I left and uh, even through Twin Image. So it was really ultimately in all the things that I ever did, tra being trained in coordinate remote viewing is the thing that, that gave me an irrefutable Refutable and an undeniable evidence that I was more than the physical and that I always have been and that I have access to it and that I can learn from it, interact with it, contribute to it. And so can everyone else uh, in this existence. And that to me was worth the repercussions, whatever they may have been. Thanks so much, uh, Dave. I appreciate you coming on my show. I'd love to bring you back on. We've we didn't sure. even really get to uh, touch on a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, which I, I expected, <laughs> but it, it's a good to get the history and the history of you. So whenever I bring you back on, we can just jump right into it and uh, dive into a bunch of other topics. Cause I really wanted to talk about uh, the different styles of remote viewing, uh, the coordinate remote viewing, the remote influencing aspect and, and stuff like that, because I believe that those things are really important, but could you let people know uh, before we uh, close down where they can find you online, a website where they can purchase your book? <laughs> the books are on Amazon and uh, I will just caution you uh, that uh, sounds true and or Amazon have not done a really good job of the, of the descriptors there. Uh, you can find Psychic Warrior there. At this time, uh, you know, St. Martin still produces it, but I think the hardcovers are difficult to find. And if you do find a hardcover that's got the blue uh, cover on it, hang on to it uh, because they've become collector's items, not because the book was written by me, but because the cover itself won an international design competition. So uh, that's why. But hang, get one of those and hang on to them. The green cover with like a bullet hole in it, that was a UK design and that's out there. It's trade paper, not mass market paper. Uh, and if you get the mass market paper, it's mass market paper. You know, it's like pulp fiction kind of stuff. Uh, there is a book I wrote, which is the uh, Coordinate Remote Viewing, the Complete User's Guide to Coordinate Remote Viewing, which is a manual. It's 430 some odd pages. Uh, it's not meant to be a standalone learning tool. It's meant to be a manual. So if you're going to learn coordinate remote viewing, it's a really good manual, but you need to take a class. Uh, I'm not teaching right now, but uh, I did teach as up until about four months ago. I'm just going through some other transitions at the moment and moving houses, et cetera. But when I re-engage, uh, we'll make sure that there's a way for people to know, and I'll make sure Please do have me back and we will 
we're rebranding and reorganizing some things so that they're slightly different than they were in the past. I would not go to davidmorehouse.com. Uh, that is just a website and stuff we're shutting down. You're just going to shut it down and, and you know, rebrand it as something different than that. Uh, I kind of lost control of that website about 15 years ago, and I'm just really not happy with the direction it went. So I want to do something different now. Uh, and if you also on Amazon, don't buy the audio version of that book I just quote, said to you, but Remote Viewing, Complete User's Guide to Coordinate Remote Viewing. <clears throat> if you buy the audio book just to listen to it, you have to buy the, the trade paper manual because the audio was recorded at my request for when I teach classes where we have um, people who are non-sighted, so therefore can't read it, as opposed to it getting in Braille, and also for uh, <clears throat> For dyslexic students who can't take sit down and read it, they can listen to it. But it doesn't have any of the graphs. It doesn't have any of the practical exercise. It doesn't have anything in there visually for you to see. So if you just buy it, you'll be big disappointed about it. Um, and if you see things like the there's a thing called the introduction of remote viewing. That is an audio introduction of a 24 CD. Uh, stage one through three training program that was done by Sounds True 18 years ago. So I wouldn't buy that either. <laughs> and and uh, it'd be, you can buy it if you just want to hear a you know, three hour lecture on the generality you know, of just general talking about remote viewing, but don't buy it because you think it's instructional because it won't be. Um, and uh, non-lethal weapons war without death which was my first book um it's a textbook and i mean it, and it's pricey so it used to be well over 100 bucks now i think I, there are versions of it they're like 49 bucks but still it'll put me to sleep and i wrote it so unless you're really interested in non-lethal technologies and how those uh, are applied you know utilizing global potential you know conflicts then it's really not the book for most people to buy. It's recommended reading at the U.S. Army War College, so it's it's a textbook about non-lethal weaponry and its employment in the military and combat zones. So if that intrigues you, so be it. But it's not something I would recommend that you go get. So Psychic Warrior and uh, Remote Viewing, you know, the Complete User's Guide to Coordinate Remote Viewing. If you're interested in what we've been talking to about tonight, that's a good thing. If you're interested in you know, the activity, then again, it is uh, Smith's book, Killer Elite. And uh, other than that, it's been a really pl a great pleasure and, and an honor for me to be here with you. I really do appreciate that. No problem, David. I've really enjoyed the conversation. The links to all of David's uh, information will be in the description of this video. Thank you so much for everyone else. Thanks for watching and listening. Much love to everyone in the chat. Please be sure to hit the <laughs> thumbs up button to help the channel out in the YouTube algorithm. Share, subscribe, and hit the bell icon as well for notifications. And I'm remember, just a floating head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're dark. <laughs> we'll get the lights on better next time. But remember, we're not only in a spiritual war, but a war on humanity. Stay aware, stay alert, keep loving your heart for everyone. Stay safe out there. And if you can see through the illusion, you are the solution. See you guys next time. Thank you.